If you have your Bible, turn me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse number 10. We've been talking the last few weeks about defending your faith, putting on the whole armor of God. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, 10, he says the final word, be strong in the Lord. He doesn't say to be strong in yourself or your own ability. He says be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor. It doesn't say the armor belongs to us. Who does the armor belong to? So put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Later on, as we read, he tells us to hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. But I want us to focus this morning to understand something. That the moment that you ask Jesus to come into your heart and life and you enter into a relationship, a right relationship with God, there, there comes something that we sometimes don't expect, and that's a battle. There's a battle that comes, and the great battle that the enemy brings against us is the battle for our faith. Uh, and as we battle for our faith, there are strategies the enemy uses, and we need to acknowledge those strategies this morning, but we also need to be aware of them so that, that we can overcome some of these strategies. The greatest strategy the victim that the, the devil uses against us is that we can become victims. Let me say it again. That, you know what? He wants to make all of us victims. Before we get to that place, let me just tell you about myself. I don't believe that everything in life, even as Christians, can be attributed to the devil. Somebody say amen. amen. You know why? Because life happens. Somebody say amen. amen. Sometimes you get a cold. Sometimes you have a flat tire. Somebody say amen. amen. Sometimes the washing machine and dryer, they break on the same day. Sometimes the kids act horrible and the dog poops on the carpet. Might have happened to all of you this morning before you got here today. And you say, I am in a battle. Well, you might be if all those things happened to you before you got here today. But I want us to understand, in the midst of life, this is what happens. There is an enemy, and it doesn't matter the circumstance and situation. He uses every opportunity, and the fiery darts and arrows that he brings are accusations he brings against God and against us as believers. And he begins to bring these fiery arrows to bring doubt and fear into your mind and heart so you begin to doubt who God is and who God is to you. So what happens is this. There are a lot of people who come to church that have a faith in a God, but they've lost their faith because they've lived life defenseless without a shield. See, when we begin to understand this strategy, the strategy is to make us a victim. Why? Because a victim has greater faith in their past than they do in God. Let me say it again. A victim has greater faith in their past than they do in God. But you understand something. A limitless God now becomes limited by continued doubt and fear. In other words, what happens is our faith becomes shipwrecked. We can come to church and continue to come to church. We can attempt to do good things, but our faith is dead. We can believe that God can do great things. Listen to me. We're just not sure if he wants to do them for us. But we believe God can heal and he can touch. We're just not certain whether he wants to do that for me. And yet Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26, but with God, everything is possible. So this morning, I want to talk to you about the strategy and how it plays out in our life and how it plays out in our, in our daily life and daily choices and decisions. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. I encourage you to bring your Bible because it can bring such encouragement to you during the week that you can come back and say, hey, okay, where is that story found? It's there in 1 Kings chapter 19. Before we get there and before we begin reading, let, let's talk about a really, really, really good day. There's some characters that are involved in this story, and you might be familiar with a few of them. First and foremost, there's a king, and his name is Ahab. And he has a wife, and her name is... Oh, we had a couple. A wife, his name is Jezebel. How many of you have ever heard of Jezebel? Uh, she's brought an evil influence into the king's life. 
She serves all of these foreign gods and idols. And because so, the, the whole kingdom has been desecrated because of idol worship. Well, because of their disobedience, God sends a prophet. His name is Elijah, and he prophesies a drought to come. And as soon as he prophesies this drought, guess what happens? There is no rain. And for years, there's no rain. Well, instead of, and this is how we do. Let's understand how this works out. They don't blame the drought on what they've done. They blame the drought on Elijah. So he becomes the most wanted man in all the country that he has to flee the country, and he does. But one day, God says to Elijah, go back and confront the king. In doing so, this is what Elijah knows. If he goes back and confronts Ahab, he's certainly going to die. But there's some kind of boldness, some holy boldness that comes on him. And so he goes and he confronts King Ahab and he said, you know what? Either what I'm saying is true or what you're saying is true. But the only way we can really find this out is to put it to a test. King says, I'm in agreement. Let's do that. So he said, here's what we'll do. You'll bring all the prophets and all the priests of Baal and we'll come to Mount Carmel and I'll give them an opportunity first. And whichever God responds by fire will be the true and living God. So the prophets of Baal come and they prepare their sacrifice and they begin to chant and they begin to sing and before long they begin to cut themselves and Elijah's having a fine time with this. In fact, before long, he begins to mock them and saying, maybe your God has gone out for dinner or maybe he's in the bathroom relieving himself. That's what he says. He said the word. They do all this stuff and nothing happens. And Elijah says, okay, it's my turn. He said, but let's do something a little bit different. Uh, let's go find some big, some big things of water, barrels of water, and let's pour them over the sacrifice. And they do it once, and they do it twice, and they do it the third time, and it fills up not only around the sacrifice and drenches it, but all of the trenches around are now filled with water. And Elijah prays this simple prayer. God, if you are who you say you are, and I am in you who you say that I am, I ask you to hear me when I call. And it says immediately, Fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. And all the people responded, as you would as well, that happened here today. And they said, you know what? Jehovah, he is God. And so Elijah gave them immediate instructions. He said, I want you to take captive the prophets of Baal. And they take captive the prophets of Baal. And he takes them to the valley below. And personally, Elijah executes all the prophets of Baal. The day's not over because there's still an issue. There's a drought in the land. And so Elijah sends his messenger to king and he tells the king, be prepared because it's about to rain. And it says, Elijah goes to the mountaintop once again. He takes his messenger with him up there and he begins to pray. And he sends his messenger to say, uh, do you see any clouds in the sky? And he looks and it's a cloudless day. He says, there's nothing to be seen. He sends him again, and there's nothing. How many of you have ever had a time in your life when there were no evidence of anything that God was doing? Can I see your hands? But the messenger comes back, and he says, Hey, I see a cloud, and it's about the size of my hand. And Elijah says, Run as fast as you can. And you tell the king, it's about to come a gully washer. That's what we call them in Texas. It's about to come a gully washer. And he runs. And he tells the king, and Elijah is so filled with faith. It is one of the greatest days of his life. Uh, and he is so filled with the Spirit. The Word of God says that he gathers up his robe in between. And he begins, and he outruns the chariot all the way back to the palace. What a great day. You know, the one thing I appreciate about the Word of God and we need to appreciate as well as Americans is this. We're, we live in a world where we embrace fantasy a lot. We embrace fantasy a lot because we don't want to deal with reality. Wait a minute, let me say it again. We spend millions of dollars 
on the internet and at the movies in fantasy because oftentimes our, our realities are so at a place that we would rather be lost in something else that's not real. And so we go to movies and we like movies that have a happily ever after. The end. They live together and in our minds and I, they never make a sequel and we just think they live together forever and everything was great. But I want to tell you something, that's not life. They had two kids and they were brats. <laughs> Come on now. He got laid off. She got uglier, she got older. <laughs> oh man. He got more good looking and they had a problem. <laughs> I'm not talking about Shelly and myself, of course. <laughs> I would be in big trouble if that were the case. <laughs> but movies. And we come to this story, and we'd say, we'd like to have a happily thereafter, that there is Elijah, he's had the, the day of all days, and man, it's got to be good. <laughs> but we come to chapter 19, verse number 1, immediately following. It says, when Ahab got home... He told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as the same way you killed them. In verse number three, it says this. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Anybody ever prayed that? I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. He's despondent, and we're going to use a word here because you're about to see it. He's depressed. It says, Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. And he looked around there beside his head with some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank. Listen to this. And lay down again. No ambition, no drive, no hope. Come on now. All he wants to do is sleep his life away. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. Well, it doesn't sound like a guy who called fire down from heaven, does it? Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake... But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? 
You know, as we look at this and we begin to understand how to overcome the fiery darts or the fiery arrows of the enemy that he's bringing at us all the time and how important our shield of faith is, that we can look at this story and understand a lot about our lives as well. Because the the number one thing that we do in our life is this, is that things are going well. We are on the victory of all victories. God is doing incredible stuff, and we don't mean to, but we let our guard down. See, Elijah's celebrating the greatest victory of his life. Before the king called down fire from heaven, prayed and prophesied, needed rain, outran a chariot, and he pretty much feels invincible. But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, life's not a fairy tale, and sometimes there's not always a happily ever after. And so this is what we think. Are you ready for this? Haven't I fought enough? Come, come on now. Anybody other than me ever had that thought or prayer? H- haven't I fought enough? H- haven't I been through enough? Uh, God, h- how, how can I handle or do anything else? It seems like everything I do is a fight. And yet we read in Ephesians, this is what it reads, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and rulers in high places, and that this enemy is continually bringing darts against us. And if we don't put on the armor of God, if we don't hold up the shield of faith, we can be taken down. And you say, well, I'd rather not fight all the time. I get it. I understand. But we also have to take into consideration what's most important to us. And I'm going to tell you the most important thing that you have is your faith. Let me say it again. The most important thing that you have is your faith. Without it, you, you, can't, you can't attain to true love. Somebody say amen. Amen. And we have to understand something. The devil is relentless. And when you make a step in the right direction, you don't know it, but what you're doing is you're sticking a stick in a wasp nest. You say, well, I would never do that. Well, me either. Amen. But that's what we do. And so we say, isn't this a great victory? Let's stay here and celebrate a little while. And before we know it... (laughs) There's a crazy queen wanting to kill us. Uh, we, we have conquered all the principalities of the day, called fire down from heaven, and some crazy queen says she's going to kill me, and the next thing you know, I'm on the run, depressed, and don't want to get up. How did that happen in just a couple of days? Simple. You let your guard down. You say, well, Pastor, that's Old Testament. Well, let me read it to you from New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. If you think you're standing strong, listen to this. Be careful not to fall. The temptations, listen to this, the temptations in your life are no different from uh, what others experience. I need an amen right there. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And look at what he says. And God is faithful. What is he saying? It's always stirred up here. It's always going on. There's always stuff happening. But here's the good news. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can, look, listen to this word, endure. That's an interesting use of words, isn't it, right there? It doesn't say so you can overcome. It says, so you can endure. You, and you understand something. The quickest don't win the race sometimes. It's the faithful who win the race. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, we were watching that just yesterday. You might have seen it. Uh, we were watching the Olympics, and, and here they were having this huh, long journey of a bike race. Anybody see this? And they get towards the end of the race, and the leaders all have a wreck. What if, and they asked the guy who won the gold, what if you had quit? He said, I was tempted. But he didn't quit. And he said, I was amazed, and I got a surge of adrenaline when I passed by the leaders, and they were all on the ground, and I thought, I can win this thing.
You see, there's times in life when you're going up the one side of the mountain where it's easy to say, let's quit here. But he says, you know what? If you will stay faithful and endure. Now, there's another part of this that we have contention with because this, when I read this, I have questions about the Word of God. I'm, on, I'm honest about this. I know I'm the preacher, and I'm not supposed to have questions like this. But here's the question that you ask and I ask when we read this scripture. How much is too much? Because my definition and God's definition are not the same. Uh, because I don't think I can handle too much. But I want you to understand what this means and what this means for us as Americans. Listen to me. We would oftentimes rather choose our convenience than we would our faith. And so if it's not convenient to us, then we think that we're really suffering. Somebody say amen. Amen. And yet today, Pastor Tyler's in Africa, and I've been there numerous, numerous times and done lots of pastor's trainings and, and conferences. And it's not unusual for me to do a conference and have preachers that will travel by foot four miles to get to the place where we're having the meeting at. By foot for four days. Or sometimes they'll travel by plane, by however they can get there, uh, numerous days just to get there. Uh, and I'll tell you how I feel when they get there and I hear their story. I'm not even qualified to be here to speak to you. Because I- I'm thinking about getting home, hoping I can get an upgrade to first class. <laughs> because it's really difficult in coach. The food is lousy. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. Pastor Shelley knows. And so we have to begin to understand the first thing that we need to understand as followers of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. And I'm not the bearer of bad news because I'm bringing hope today. There's always a battle. And day after day, let me tell you, you have to keep your shield up. Because if you don't keep the shield of faith up and you let it down, the accusations get real personal. And before long, this is what you're thinking. Well, I guess God loves everybody else but me. Well, I'm coming to church, and I know God can heal people, and I know he can deliver people, but maybe he just does that for other people and not me. And we find ourselves oftentimes as a church, we're powerless because we're powerless in our faith. So the second part is this, and it's a strategy, that the devil oftentimes can't get to us any way else but through our fears. And can I tell you something? Fear will always overwhelm your faith. Now, let's, let's talk about fears and so we understand something. Fears are instinctive and they're natural. But we have to choose our faith through prayer, the study of God's Word, and faith encouragement through godly people and materials that encourage us. Jesus continually told his disciples, don't be afraid. So we ask ourselves the question today. If God loves me, then why? How many of you think that's a legitimate question? Come on now. How many of you think that's a legitimate question? If God loves me, then why am I having to go through what I'm going through? But I want us to understand something. It's important that we understand this. This world is not a perfect world. And let me say this as well. It's never going to be a perfect world. We can have dreams and ambitions through politicians and through all kinds of ideas, but I want you to understand this world is depraved, and there's nothing that can cure that other than what's been done through the cross of Jesus Christ. But here's some good news. He's coming with a different kingdom, and I plan on being a part of it. Do you plan on being a part of this new kingdom? It's a new kingdom where, listen to me, there is no sickness, there's no disease, there's no sin. Uh, There there aren't any issues that appear on the headlines every day. You know why? Because there's a king who's on the throne, and everybody that's there wants to be there. I I, I take great umbrance with people who say, you know what, everybody's going to heaven. That's just not true. It's just not true. The people that are going to be in heaven want to be in heaven. Uh, And they want to serve this king forever and ever and ever. You know why? Because he's a perfect king with a perfect plan. I like talking about it. And if you'll, if you'll pardon me for just a moment, I want to talk about it. Because I, I say often, people say, well, heaven's going to be a boring place. And not at all. It's not going to be boring at all. Because we're going to see the bigger picture. 
As Paul Harvey used to say, now the rest of the story. And now we're going to get the rest of the story. And we're going to see all the times in our life that God intervened. Listen to me. The time like the prophet, he didn't want to get up and he chose to go on a hunger strike and just die. But you know what? God in his grace and mercy said, I'm going to send an angel down to the prophet and I'm going to love him and I'm going to sustain him and nourish him because I'm not through with him yet. But you know, there are times and seasons and places in our life where God does the same thing with us. That we have plans to even to bring destruction upon ourselves. But I can tell you something. God has greater plans. So first we have fear, and fear, fear, fear comes on us, and all of a sudden we're running, and we're, we're hiding, and we're disappointed because of our fear. And because of this disappointment, because of this fear, the next thing that we do is we isolate ourselves. The prophet sends away his servant and goes by himself. And you say, why is this so important? Because this is a part of the strategy. Because this is what we truly believe, and this is what he said. Nobody can identify with my plight but me. You don't know what I'm going through. Hey, don't talk to me about that. You're not going through what I'm going through. Sound familiar? And the next thing you know, we're going away from even the people that we love, that care for us and pray for us, but we've isolated ourselves because we've made our problem bigger than God and bigger than others. And fear has moved us to a place. And I want you to understand something. If the devil can isolate you, he will steal your faith. Let me say it again. If the devil can isolate you, he will steal your faith. But the greater deception in all this is what we see in this story of Elijah is this. Is that here he is and he decides, okay, I'm going to go 40 days to get to Mount Sinai and for... Forty days he rehearses who he is in his speech before God. That the first time God speaks to him, I want you to understand, he doesn't even hear what God is saying to him. And so God comes, and there is the wind, and there is the earthquake, and there is the fire. And finally, there is a still small voice, and Elijah hears him. And the great danger is, is this, is when our deception becomes the new normal in our life. And our faithless existence always requires justification. And justification is this daily rehearsal that is our victim mentality that says, you know what, this is what happened to me. And this is why I am the way that I am. Listen to me. I'm not saying I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. Everybody hearing me? This is who I am and this is why this happened to me. And if you knew my story, then you would know me. Hold on just a second. Didn't you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life? Aren't you a new creation in him? Yeah. Then why are you rehearsing the old story? Yeah. And Elijah rehearsed the story, and he rehearsed the story, and after 40 days and 40 nights, he doesn't even hear God, and he says, Listen, I'm the only one left. This world is going to hell in a handbasket, and I'm ready to check out. Still small boy says, listen, Elijah, what are you doing here? What happened? One day you're on Mount Carmel, man of faith and power, calling out fire, and a crazy queen calls you out, and you run and get depressed and want to die. How could you not know that you need to keep your guard up all the time? Now listen, because this is the place that it comes. And we, we, have to, we have to check our attitude right now. You ready? How many of you know that faith is important? It's vital. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, and it is impossible. Say, everybody say with me, impossible. impossible. It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe, number one, that God exists. Well, that's pretty easy. How many of you believe God exists? That's not the end of it. Number two, and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Hold on just a second. 
I know God can do that for Pastor Shelly. Pastor Shelly talks about how she prays and she gets up in the night. And so I, I believe God could do that for Pastor Shelly, but God's not going to do that for me. Hold on just a second. What does the Word say? Faith is the believing that God exists and that he, he still want, He's no respecter of persons and He wants to do the same for you. Amen. That's really weak. We're not all victims today, are we? Come on, we're not all victims today, are we? Then we should believe that God wants to do something great for me too. But pastor, if you knew my story and where... Hold on just a second. That's not new religion that you've created through your deception. It's not the word of God. Faith is, it's impossible to please God without faith. And you must believe, number one, that God exists. Number two is this, that he loves you enough that he wants to do great things for you too. But if you knew all the things that I've done, Pastor, in my lifetime, I'm so undeserving. And here's, here's the good news today. We all are. The Bible says, for all have sinned. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't, there is this, okay, we're going to break this down. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we're all in the same boat. And Christ came, and through what he did on the cross, it says he translated us and took us out of the kingdom of darkness and moved us into the kingdom of light. Did, did we deserve that? Had we done anything to merit that? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, the new religion of our victim mentality doesn't seek to hear from God because we don't really want to hear what he has to say because it's about us. Victims can never see the bigger picture because they can only see themselves. And listen to me, God is always a bigger picture God. Can, I've got time. Can I share a story with you? This week, I, I'm doing a Bible study on the book of James, and for the last 20 years, once a week, I go to Happy Harbor Retirement Apartments, and I do a Bible study and have a wonderful time, and I'm blessed more than they are to be there, to be honest with you. I, I was there th this last week, and I was talking out of the book of James, and James begins his book by saying something that's silly to us. He says, consider it joy when you go through different trials and tribulations. For the testing of your faith can produce endurance. And then he says this, if you lack wisdom, ask God who can give you wisdom. And wisdom is, is a word that's used for insight. But he says this, going back to faith, he says, your faith can't waver. In other words, you, you have to believe it's God and God alone. And so I was sharing this and I said, it's, it's amazing to me how many times I've asked God specifically for something and he's told me to do something else completely unrelated, at least I thought it was completely unrelated, and it came around full circle and worked out completely the way he had planned. Because his wisdom is not our wisdom. And so he tells us to do something and we say, that doesn't make any sense. I'm praying about this situation and circumstance. And so there's a lady there. She comes often and, and she's a real blessing to me. And she said, I just had something like that happen in my life. You see, for the last three years, we've been praying for her granddaughter who's a teenager. And what she didn't tell me was this. She said, my granddaughter... In the last year, she got pregnant. She said, I met, raised my son the right way, and yet my son had big dreams and ambitions for his daughter, and, and he wanted her to accomplish great things, and she was going to go to this college, and she was going to graduate this way, and she was going to get this kind of draw, job, and all that kind of went out the window when this happened. And she said, as much as I... I believe with all my heart that abortion is wrong and it's murder and it's a sin. And I raised my son the same way. All of a sudden, he was pressuring his daughter to have an abortion. And so my granddaughter, she says, called me. And she said, Grandma, she said, I need you to talk to Dad because we need to change this situation because he's pressuring me so hard that I'm going to end up doing this and it's going to, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. So she said, I went to prayer. 
And the only thing I got in prayer was this. He said, you need to call him. Because something big had happened in our relationship several years earlier, and, and I never told him. She said, you need to call him and tell him that you have forgiven him over that. So she said, I intended on calling him, and I really, in my mind, I thought, I'm going to talk to him about my granddaughter, but I'm also going to mention this because God said to. But she said, when I picked up the phone, the first thing that I did was I, I just said, listen, you know that thing that happened a couple years ago between us? I never got a chance to tell you, but I forgave you. He said there was silence on the other end, and that was the end of the conversation. Didn't ever talk to her about the granddaughter, didn't talk to her about any of that stuff. And she said, I hung up thinking, wow, that's kind of crazy. She said the very next day, the granddaughter called, and she said, what did you say to Dad? Because his whole attitude has changed. He's preparing. He's getting a nursery ready for the baby. Uh, he, he's making plans for me when I get pregnant and what's going to happen during my pregnancy. And when I have the baby and what's going to happen after I have the What did you do? She said, I didn't do anything other than what God told me to do. See how God in his wisdom oftentimes, he, he takes us to something that we believe completely unrelated how many of you have ever had that happen? Do something completely unrelated. And he comes around and has a way of making it all work out. So you say, Pastor, I realize this morning as you're speaking about this that I've allowed my past to determine my future. What can I do? Well, this is church. And I'm amazed at sometimes in church how... In the world we live in, because we want to give people easy answers, we say, well, just come to Jesus and kneel down here and it'll all be okay. But it's really not that easy. Somebody say amen. amen. Because if it's a battle, you understand it's your battle and I can't fight it for you. Yeah. So what do I have to do today? You have to re-engage the enemy. And you know how you have to do that? You have to put the shield of faith, and this is what the shield of faith says. You overcome by reengaging the accuser of your faith. True faith is not about my circumstance or how I feel. Amen. I'm going to wait for the amens on that one. Amen. True faith is not about my circumstances or how I feel. Look, you, you know what true faith is? True faith is about my acknowledgement about who God is. Amen. So even when I don't feel it, you know what I tell the enemy now? God is good! Amen. And he says, but look at what you're going through, and look at this, and look at this circumstance. And I put it back up, and I say, I want to tell you something. God is good! Amen. No matter what. And he comes to me and says, you're going to fail. And, you're, and I say, you know what? I might fail. But here's another thing. God is faithful. The word says that even when I'm unfaithful, guess what? He's always faithful. And he says, how can you be so sure? After all, God may be holding out on you. And I hold up the book of Hebrews. And it says, it's impossible for God to lie. And I put up my shield of faith and I say, God is true. He doesn't lie like you. God is always truthful. And then he says, he doesn't really love you. And I tell him, that's funny, because Jesus died on a cross for me. And the Bible says, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for a friend. And I didn't call him a friend, he called me a friend. Because Jesus died for me, and I re-engage. You say, how often do you have to do that? Every day. See, I want you to understand something. It's more than words. 
It's more than a confession. It's a conviction. Because I want you to understand something. And this means more to me than I can ever say. I tried to get through it in the end, last service, and I'm trying again today because in the end, he wins. Amen. Amen. Let me read it to you, Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. And its rider was named faithful and true. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. What is his name? Come on, what is his name? What is his name? It doesn't say Yeshua there. His name is faithful and true. And when I can't stand, he does. And when I think I can't stand it anymore, he does. And when I can't be faithful, he is. And every day I have to engage and I have to stand and I have to say, you know what, I'm tired and I don't feel like fighting anymore. But you know what, he's faithful. Because when I'm weak, he's strong. And so this week, Pastor Shelley and I, we've been praying in things in our life and family and things we're praying about that we hold dear to us. And one morning I got up and she had a scripture. And one morning I got up in this song, this Tommy Walker song started going through my head. It's not about the circumstance, but it says this, when I cried out for mercy... You are there because you are good. You know what? He's good. Come on, he's good all the time. All the time he's good. And I just hold to it and I put my shield there and I say, you know what? doesn't matter how I feel. doesn't matter what I think or what I perceive or how I see things. Guess what? You're always good and want the best for my life. And so, you know what? I'm not going to let down my faith. I'm not going to be the preacher who loses his faith. I'm not going to be the preacher that stands up and just gives an encouraging word about how the power of your smile can change the world. We're going to talk, talk in real terms here because you know what? It's a real battle. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but of principalities and powers and rulers in high places that are coming against us in our faith. And he's diligent and he's relentless in taking our faith because if he can steal your faith, listen to me, he will steal your future. You say, well, how do, how do I overcome this? Well, there's some telltale signs. Huh. I see them in me sometimes. That all of a sudden you're becoming innately very negative insensitive anybody know what I'm talking about anesthetized yourself so you don't have to feel the pain anymore but you just really what you've done is you're laying down your shield of faith you're just quitting and sitting back in the easy chair and saying I've had it and like the prophet you're just sitting under the broom tree waiting to die but we say it often and it's true if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. And today's the day to re-engage. Today's the day to pick up the shield of faith once again. It does say, not, it doesn't matter what my circumstance has been, will be, or is going to be. God is faithful. God is good, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And I'm going to be the one standing behind the shield of faith saying, God is good. You say, well, it looks, it looks like a really bit difficult situation, and it is. But I'm going to tell you something. God is good. Somebody say amen. amen. Bow your heads with me today. 
Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Allen, I have succumbed to the enemy's strategies. He's been relentless. I didn't want to, but I find myself more a victim than a man or woman of faith. But today, Pastor, God, I want to re-engage. That means I'm laying the past down behind me and what it's been, and I'm making an affirmation of faith that says, you are good all the time. It doesn't matter who I am and how I change, you never change because your word says it's impossible for you to change. And I bank on that today. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. I, I, I battled this and I battled discouragement. I might have been battled discouragement as the prophet did. But today I want to re-engage. I want to get back in the fight. If that's you, will you raise your hand right now and I'd like to pray with you this morning. Hands going up all over the place without exception. If you raised your hand, you're going to put the shield up today. Stand up with me and let's pray together. Stand up right where you're at and let's just pray together. Lord, we acknowledge our frailty. We acknowledge our weakness. We acknowledge our mistakes. Our affirmation today is that you are good all the time. Without exception, you remain faithful. You remain true. In fact, your name is faithful and true. I want everybody in this place to say that with me right now. Let's acknowledge that out loud. Your name is faithful and true. So I'm going to say it with me. Come on, let's say it again. Yeah. Now, Lord, it doesn't matter how I feel or how I assess the situation, how dark or dire it might be. Your name is faithful and true. <laughs> Your name is faithful and true. And today I hold up the shield. I hadn't had it for a while, but it's back in my hand and I'm engaging because you have great things for my family. You have great things for my future. You have great things for the purpose and plan you created me for. And today I re-engage because you are a great God. <laughs> because you are a great God. And Lord, we give you glory. And we give you honor and we give you affirmation. And today our conviction and confession is changed. We're not, we're not going to be that person any longer. We're not going to be the victim any longer. Today, we're no longer the stepchild mentality. Today, today, we are a child of God, loved and called by you, by name. And we walk out of this place today with a new understanding and new faith. And we give you glory for it because it's your word that changed us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand today. Okay, this is where we have to start today. It's, it's a new confession. You ready? I am a child of God. Come on now, you have to say it like you mean it. I am a child of God. You say, well, you know, it feels good in here today, and I wish we could stay here all day. But we're going to go out in the real world right now, and we've got to put up the shield because you know what? It's going to hit us in the parking lot. How do you know that's true? We, we have to engage and say, you know what? God is faithful all the time. He's good all the time. His name is faithful and true. We love you. God loves you. He wants the best for your life. Have a great Sunday. We look forward to seeing you soon. You're dismissed.